this morning, <clears throat> let's see, where are we at here? Yeah, this morning we are in the Gospel of John, and we're going to be looking at the Spirit of Truth. Prior to this, we were looking through John chapter 14, verses 7 through 14, where it's talking about the fact that those who believe will do great works, but these great works are not greater than Christ's works. They're greater in number in relation to what he was doing. It is a manifestation of the quality of God's life here on earth, because there's going to be a whole lot more of us. But it is not saying that we, as followers of Christ, are going to do much greater works than Christ did. If that was the case, you know, there wouldn't be anybody sick today. There wouldn't be anybody dead today, because why? we'd be going around healing everybody and raising the dead, you know. This is what Christ did. You can't you can't go back and say that we've done something greater. Um, I mean, what 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 greater thing is there than to forgive a person their sins and heal them? That's pretty incredible. So it's not talking about the fact that we are going to do greater things than Christ did, but more, a lot more, because of the ability that we have. Well, this new relationship that's going to come about, really. And then we talked about the fact that Christ is going to ask the Father, and he's going to send another comforter, and this is the Holy Spirit. Now, we'll pick back up in John chapter 14 and verse 17, where he's talking about this new comforter. And here we have the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. To remember, truth is seeing things as they really are. So the Spirit is going to present things in an accurate way. He is the Spirit of truth. He doesn't bring lies or any aspect of lies. He only reveals things as they truly are. Now, the world cannot receive him. The, the world today, the world system, it has no ability to actually receive him. And we see an example of this over in John chapter 1 and verse 11, where he came to his own things— this would be the things related to the that are in the world, but his own people did not receive him. Now, if his own people are not going to receive him, what do you think the Gentile nations are going to do? Okay. The world isn't going to receive him. And the reality is Christ is not of the world. He doesn't come out from the world system. He's not involved with Satan in any way. We see in John chapter 8 and verse 23, it says, And he said to them, You are out, or you are from beneath, or out from beneath. I am from above, that is out from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. So he's not a part of this world. When it comes to the wisdom of this world, it is actually foolishness to God. And we see him showing how foolish it actually is. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of this world? You know, and one of the aspects of the wisdom of this world has to do with debating. Debating has no actual value in truth. Debating is about persuading somebody to agree with your argument regardless of whether it's based upon truth or not. That is the world system. That's why we have politicians who get up and debate each other. It's world system stuff, and it's actually foolishness. And yeah, if you, if you listen to what they say in their debates and what they actually do, they don't line up because they're just there to persuade you. Wisdom of the world system, it's foolishness to God. It does not present the truth. The world cannot watch him. And when it, back over in John chapter 14, verse 7, when it says the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, it also says because they cannot, the world cannot see him. But this word see here is like seeing as in a theater. It cannot examine the Holy Spirit. They can't sit back and watch what he's doing. So this is your word, uh, this particular word here. Uh, for seeing, because remember, in the original, we have three different predominant words that are used for seeing and how you see. Actually, there's a few more, too, in there. 
So, because you have your seeing, like in the general glance, you have your see with discernment. And here we have more of a seeing with, uh, like you're watching a theater, you're watching what's going on. So it's a little bit different in its focus here. The world can't watch what he's doing. A change of relationship is actually coming. You know, because here in verse uh, 14, it goes, or 13, uh, well, 13 says, um, no, excuse me, let me get it back over here, 17, yeah, so in 17, as it's going on, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, and this is experientially no, the world system has no way to experientially know the Holy Spirit predominantly because the world system isn't of truth and he is the spirit of truth but you know him for he dwells with you now you know him he's specifically talking to the disciples at this point you have an experiential knowledge of him because they have actually experienced the holy spirit influencing them in their lives while they were with christ so they have an experiential knowledge. It's for he dwells with you. And this word with literally means alongside you. And will be in you. There's a change in the relationship with the Holy Spirit. He was with, but now he's going to be in. Now, prior to the church, the beginning of the church. Now, this is in Acts chapter 2, where we have the beginning of the church. We cannot, by the way, move the beginning of the church in later into the book of Acts when Paul goes to the uh, Gentiles, because that would divide the church. That is, we would have a Jewish church and a Gentile church, and that's not scriptural. Scripture is pretty clear that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Gentile. It really comes from a misunderstanding of the fact that God was dealing with Israel. Christ came for Israel. He did not come for the Gentiles. Now, in his coming, the Gentiles, they were definitely going to benefit from that. The Old Testament talks about that. But his purpose, his intent, wasn't to come for the Gentiles to save them. It was for Israel. And then through Israel, the Gentiles would be saved. When it comes to the beginning of the church, the intent was to bring it to Israel. Paul even talks about this in Romans. He says, first to the Jews, then to the Gentiles. So first, the church goes to the Jews. The gospel related to the Christ went to the, Jew, went to the Jews first. When the Jews rejected it, the Gentiles actually were received in. Now, that's not to say that God wasn't showing in that, that he's also accepting Gentiles, because even when he was focusing on the Jews, he's, he began to show them he is actually doing something different, and he's allowing the Gentiles in. Okay. So it's a misunderstanding of that when you go and you say, well, when, when uh, in Acts, when Paul finally went over to the Gentiles, we have a new dispensation. You violate all the rules of the dispensations. Okay, where's the judgment on the church of the Jews? There is no judgment. And all dispensations end in judgment. Okay. So when he's talking about here, there's going to be a change in relationship. He's talking about all prior to the church, that is all saints prior to the church, the Holy Spirit was with them. He wasn't in them, and he could leave and would at times. He wasn't with them all the time necessarily. We see an example of this over in Psalms chapter 51 and verse 11. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Now, this is David. He is, of course, um, expressing great regret for what he has done and very much concerned over the Holy Spirit going from him. It's interesting, by the way, that even though in predominantly, you know, the Jewish community today is really in unbelief, but it is interesting when you go back into uh, Old Testament that even David knew there was the Spirit of God. He was fully aware, and that would mean 
there has to be at least two persons of the Godhead. You know, there's no other way that that can happen. So David understood that. And he says, don't take your Holy Spirit from us. Now, it is quite different for us who are in Christ because the Holy Spirit never leaves us. But this is why we can grieve the Holy Spirit, why we can quench the Holy Spirit, because he's always with us. And remember, grieving and quenching, that involves ignoring the desires you get from the Holy Spirit. And sometimes, by the way, those desires can be very subtle. We really shouldn't do this. We should be doing something else. We should be focusing on it, something different. And then we're like, oh, no, I really want to do this thing. Well, you know, it might not be that beneficial. You know, I mean, yeah, I'm keeping it very generic on purpose because there's a lot of different things that we can be focusing on. It might be instead of uh, reading some scripture and spending some time in the word, you're watching a movie. But that movie isn't really a good, uh, it doesn't put your mind in a good place. Not necessarily a bad movie. It just doesn't put your mind in a good place. And the Holy Spirit would rather you focus on something else. So you get the desire to do something else. But you're like, oh, I really want to watch this movie, though. So you make a decision. Okay. It doesn't harm you in the sense that, again, it's not like a wicked movie. It's just your focus isn't correct. You're not paying attention to the desires of the Holy Spirit. Now, there's other times where his desires are very strong in us. In contrast to what, especially in relation to the sin nature, his his desires will be so strong that the desires from the sin nature will come up and be like, no, I'm not interested in doing none of that. Okay. So it goes both ways. We pay attention, we grow, we mature because he's actually in us. He dwells in us all the time. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 21 through 22 talks about the fact that after the resurrection of Christ, the Holy Spirit actually indwells us. This is one of many passages, but here it says, in whom the, we, the church, in whom the whole building, being fitly together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Now, that word holy temple is your holy of holies. That's where God dwells in the temple. So the church is not the temple as far as the tabernacle, the whole thing. The church is the holy of holies, where God actually resides. And then it goes on, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of the Spirit, or of, of God in the Spirit, which actually I think it's a, yeah, a dwelling place of God, a place where God will dwell down in Spirit. The Spirit is actually going to be one who dwells in us because we have the Godhead indwelling. We're built into the Holy of Holies, where God actually resides. Truth is manifested, of course, when it comes to seeing things as they really are, and truth because he is the spirit of truth. We see this truth being manifested not by your words, but by your actions. It's, yeah, it's not, truth isn't just about seeing things as they really are. It's in seeing things as they really are, you begin to act accordingly. Over in 1 John chapter 3, verses 18 through 19. My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed, in your word, deed, there is works, and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth, that is out from the truth, and shall assure our hearts before him by our actions, not by our words. Are we loving the brother? And remember, love for the brother and is seeking the best for them. Is that our focus? You know, we cannot say that we love God if we don't love our brothers. If we're not taking care of fellow Christians, that is. A big issue in many assemblies. Many assemblies today are focused on unbelievers and bringing in unbelievers. The assemblies are not for unbelievers. The assemblies are for the believers. Scripture is very clear on that. So that we grow and we mature. But if you're going to make an assembly that's focused on unbelievers, what are you going to tend to do? You're going to focus on milk, no meat. The basic things. 
And then, of course, the the unbelievers really aren't going to be that interested in it. So you're going to start changing things, especially the gospel. Not getting very many converts when you present the fact that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again on the third day. So, you know, some people will just start dropping part of it, start, start dropping the resurrection, start changing it. Oh, Christ died for you personally, your sins misunderstanding the gospel making a person feel of more value than they really are you know and then of course they present a false gospel in it i mean who who doesn't know that they've sinned in this world we all know we've sinned right? and if we could just wipe that sin away by saying i'm sorry most people be willing to do that even though they're not necessarily sorry. Because remember, your word repent actually literally means to change your mind. That's a whole nother focus. So back over in John chapter 4 and verse uh, 18, he goes on and he says, Christ will actually not leave us alone. Uh, and I'm supposed to be in 14, not in 4. I jumped to the wrong one there. Because we definitely don't want to go back to... to uh, chapter 4, so we're in 14, John chapter 14 and verse 18. And I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Um, this orphan, uh, we actually see kind of the concept of one who is left without their parents. And this is basically what he's saying. I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm sending another comforter to be with you. But over in Thessalonians, we also see this kind of being expressed with Paul, because Paul was really taken away from the saints in Thessalonica before he had time to really talk about all the things related to being in Christ. And you know, it's not like in Ephesus where he had time to declare the entire counsel of God to them. In Thessalonica, he only had three Sabbaths. That was it. Or really, it was, I think, on the third Sabbath, he was actually kicked out by then. So here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 17, it says, But we, brethren, having been taken away. Well, your word taken away there is actually a word that means bereavement. The loss of one's parent. That's what the actual Greek word means there. You, for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavor more eagerly to, to see your face with great desire. So we're not going to be left without a parent. We're not going to be left without somebody who is going to support us. This is why he's sending the Holy Spirit, to be a paraclete for us. And then, of course, Christ specifically promises he is going to return. He's going to come back for us. Now, this coming back, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, is talking about the rapture. Now, remember, the rapture in, in Scripture is not, the word rapture is not actually used in Scripture. It is a theological term to describe something that Scripture reveals. Okay? The, the closest you get is when it talks about the snatching away of the church in 1 Thessalonians. Now, the snatching away of the church happens before the man of lawlessness is revealed, which means I don't care how wicked our world leaders are today, they are not the man of lawlessness. The church will not know who the man of lawlessness is, because in order for the man of lawlessness to rise, the church has to leave this earth. And then he's going to rise. But Christ did promise he's going to get he's going to come back. This is not the second coming of Christ. At the second coming of Christ, he is going to come really like the Jews expected him to come the first time. The first time the Jews expected him to come and destroy their enemies. So here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16, it says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of an archangel which would be the, really the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive will remain and remain, will be caught up together with them in the clouds 
to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. We will be called up to the Lord. He's not coming to earth when this happens. That is a promise. So he's giving us that promise through the disciples on the night in which he was betrayed. He said, I am going to return. I'm absolutely going to return. When Christ leaves this world, though, the world's not going to be able to watch him. So we're over in John chapter 14, verses 19 through 25 is where this is focused at. Okay. In John chapter 14, verse 19, it says, In a little while longer, and the world will see me no, no more. Now, this is the theater term. The world can watch Christ while he was physically walking on the earth. He could, they, they could watch him. But the world's not going to be able to watch him anymore. But you will see me. You'll be able to watch me. Because I live, you will also live. Christ showed himself to the brethren in his resurrection. Remember that. Okay. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in 1 through 4, we get a focus on the gospel for salvation. Okay. In 5, it talks about the fact that, and this would be the evidence of his resurrection, he actually showed himself not just to the disciples, but to a substantial amount of people. So over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 5 through 6, it says, and this is after his resurrection, that he was raised on the third day, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the, by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to this present, but some have fallen asleep. So when Paul wrote this, he's saying, there's over 500 witnesses, and you can go ask them yourself. Okay. They were, many of them were still alive. The disciples actually see Christ leave the earth after his resurrection. So they do see him. The world doesn't see him. But, but the disciples will. Acts chapter 1 and verse 9 talks about this. And now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, they were glancing at him. He was taken up in a cloud and received him out of their sight. So they actually saw him afterwards. In that day, he then goes on, they will experientially know that Christ is in the Father because we're going to be in Christ. And this is in John chapter 14 and verse 20. He's talking about here, he says, in that day, you will know that I am in the, my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Again, he's talking about a different kind of a relationship that's going to happen. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 talks about this and says, I have, I have been crucified with Christ, co-crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Christ lives in me. And through that living in me, I actually understand that Christ is in the Father. You know, that these, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they're the same being. But they are individual. This is, of course, why you get um, references in the Old Testament, holy, holy, holy. It's not vain repetition, because God does not like vain repetition. Holy, holy, holy is a description of the fact that God is in three individual persons. That's why the spirit beings actually say that. Okay. They're not being emphatic of God's holiness. That's not really not actually the way you would say that anyway, if you were being emphatic. It's, it's repetition, but there's a purpose behind that. We're in Christ. Christ is in us. We're part of the new creation, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, where it says, Wherefore, since someone is in Christ, a new creation, all things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's all things in Christ have become new. We are a part of this new creation. 
This new creation, of course, is made up of Christ being the head and the church, the body. This new creation takes us out of Adam, which means we're no longer condemned because we're placed into Christ where we're counted as righteous. And we're counted as righteous because the head is righteous. Therefore, we have a hope related to this proper opinion that God has of us. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27. To them, God desirously willed to make known what are the riches of the glory. And remember your word glory means to have a proper opinion of. So what are the riches of the proper opinion of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of a proper opinion? That hope of that glory that, we, that we're we expressing really what who we are, who we truly are. Expressing a proper opinion of what God says about us. That is the glory. That is the hope that we actually have. Now, the one guarding his commandments back over in uh, John chapter 14, verse 21, is, of course, going to love Christ. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. Now, this manifesting is not talking necessarily about a visible manifestation. Matter of fact, we cannot see Christ. First John talks about that. When we see him, we will be like him. We do not see Christ in his resurrected state. You know, Christ did reveal himself to the disciples after his resurrection, but they didn't see him in his full glory at that point. They cannot, or could not at that point, nor can we, because as soon as we see him in his full glory, we're going to be like him. Which, act, when you think about it, it makes sense, because if God showed, if Christ, in this sense, showed us his full glory, we wouldn't understand it. We're not in a state where we could comprehend it. But when we actually see him, we're going to be in a state where we can comprehend who he is. Because we're going to be just like him. On the Mount of Transfiguration, he uh, manifested his glory in a uh, prior to his resurrection. So Peter, John, they saw him basically, really the, the best way you could describe it is he became very bright. But that was a glory prior to his resurrection. So it was a glory of one who is righteous, but hasn't um, Christ had not been put to death and then fully resurrected, which is a completely different level of, of uh, glory. And we see an example of that, of course, uh, with uh, on the Damascus Road, where Paul sees this glory of Christ that's brighter than the sun, the noonday sun. So, yeah, he was manifested on the Mount of Transfiguration, but that would not be the equivalent to the resurrected glory. They were able to, it's not like they were so bright they couldn't actually see a person there, but they were definitely shining very brightly. Um, so you see, Christ, even prior to his resurrection, was a righteous man. As a matter of fact, that's what that Mount of Transfiguration shows. Christ actually was righteous before his resurrection. His resurrection didn't make him righteous. His resurrection was because he is righteous. They put, him, they put a righteous man to death. Death is for the unrighteous, not for the righteous. God raised him from the dead, and in raising him from the dead... What did God actually do, God the Father? He answered Christ's prayer. And what was Christ's prayer? Glorifying. There was glorifying, there was forgiving. But in that, when he's really, really focused on what is about to happen, he says, save me from this death. Did the Father save him from this death? He raised him from the dead, and Christ can die no more. That's that's not, oh, I'm going to make this army go away, and then maybe eventually one day you'll die. No, that's like, I've not, I've completely saved you from death. 
yeah, you died, but I brought you back to life, and now you cannot die again. Ah, uh, yeah, you could, I think that word, uh, if I recall, it is sozo. I'd have to go back. Let's actually go look at it. Because that's a good verse. I'm not sure where that is, but let me see. Um, yeah, it's coming up in John, but I'm trying to recall what how he actually uh, says this. That is in English, so I can actually pull it up. So uh, I think he's talking about your will and not uh, in that area. He talks about this. Um, well, Luke talks about this in one of the areas. I know it's also a little bit later, but Luke says, um, where he's saying, Father, Luke 22, 42, if it is your desires, will take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And then over in Hebrews, it talks about the fact that he uh, heard him and delivered him. And I think it's Hebrews that I'm actually thinking of, because Hebrews talks about the fact that he heard him and then he delivered him from death. Yeah, in the days of his flesh, Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 7, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayer, now your word prayer, there is supplication, and um, this word, uh, the word they translate supplication actually is a word that means requests, uh, with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him out from death and was heard because of his godly fear. Yet Christ died on the cross. So how can we say that God the Father heard him? Because of the reaction of God the Father to that death. God raised him from the dead so he could never die again. So in this, uh, it is uses the word sozo. But sozo can actually focus on delivery. Um, he did not need to be saved in the sense of um, being declared righteous. He already was righteous. Okay. So we are saved because we, are, in our salvation, we are declared righteous. Because Christ's death for sins and his resurrection is applied to us. Both of those. So that's over in Hebrews. Um, now, back over in... John chapter 14, verse 20, where he's talking about this in verse 21 specifically. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father. Now, being loved by the Father is actually something that's really important to understand because the Father, oh, let me jump back up here, yeah. How does the Father actually love us? One of the areas we see his love is actually in discipline. Over in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 5 through 6, it talks about the fact that we are not to forget the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. Now, that's important to understand the distinction here. He does not say as children. He says as sons. The word sons means something. One who is mature. Okay. My son, do not despise the chastening. This is the child training of the Lord. Nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he child trains. Yeah, a Christian will not be permitted to live like the world system. He will be child trained. You know, and it may simply be, this is the one who every time they do something wrong gets caught. Everybody else gets away with it, but you get caught every single time. You know, it could be something simple like that to where God is saying, no, not you. You're not to be part of that. And it can, of course, be far more intense, especially if we decide we're going to ignore God. He may choose to cripple us. Yes, because in a crippled state, 
we are going to be able to still glorify God. That's not going to impact our ability to live out who we are in Christ, but it will impact our ability to live like the, the devil's child. So he's willing to do that. And of course, he'll even take it to the point where he'll put you to death if you want to continue to sin. Knowing full well, you should not be a part of that. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 32 talks about the fact that when we are judged, we are child trained. We are not, we don't stand before a judge and are judged for our sins or our works. That has already been taken care of or will have been fully taken care of because our sins have been washed away. But how do we deal with our works? Because there's still our works. Does Christ deal with the work part of it? It does. You know, and, and I'm, this has been on my mind a lot lately because, well, I kind of expect, you know, we're going to be stepping into eternity here shortly. And when we do, we're going to go before the beam seat. And scripture talks about the fact that Christ has found something in the church that's extremely precious. Like how? When Christ purges us from everything that is uh, bad, what is going to be left over? And this is at the Bema seat when we face reward. Now, when we face reward, our works are going to be examined. And any work that does not line up is going to be destroyed. Which means at the end result of that, we are going to be absolutely pure. That's incredible to think about. You will not have these works anymore. They will be destroyed. And the only ones you'll have are the ones that actually matter, the ones that are of value. And we're all going to have some. And I suspect some of us are going to have less than we think because God's going to, he's going to go right down to the intent of why you did it so that we are truly pure. So after the resurrection of the church, the church can't face judgment because the church is absolutely righteous and pure, blameless. Nobody can bring an accusation against us. Satan is going to look at the church and you'd be like, I got nothing. That's going to be the first time we're going to see him silenced in the accusation against the brother. He's going to look at us and he's going to say, there's nothing there to accuse the church of. They're completely pure. And he's going to turn to the other ones. You know, when we are child trained, we are, or when we're judged, we're child trained here on earth. God treats you like a child. If you really think about that, that should be a little embarrassing for, for a uh, Christian. Uh, you know, same thing with your ch children. When your children are grown up and they start doing something wrong and you as their parent correct them as though they're a little child, that's a little embarrassing. But they've stepped out of line. And if they're smart, they'll they'll recognize that and be like, yeah, that was not a good thing for me to be doing. The end result, I know better than that. And it's kind of the same thing with a Christian. But he will not allow us to be condemned with the world. By the way, this is one of those passages that really helps us understand why God continues to permit wicked people to be so wicked. He's going to let them fill up to the full their judgment. He's not going to stop them. He's not going to show mercy. But to his own children, he will not permit that. Because the world system's going, it's going headlong into its own judgment. Remember that all things work for good for those who are loving God. And we know, this is over in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. And we know, this is we intuitively know, that all things work together for good, your word good here is beneficial, for the benefit, to those who love, and this is actively loving God. Now, how do we actively love God? We love the brethren. We cannot say we love God and then are indifferent to our fellow saints. It doesn't work that way. In loving our, our brethren, 
we are actually expressing the fact that we have love for God. Because in doing that, what are we actually doing in loving other saints? We're abiding by the commandment we were given. If we're abiding by the commandment that we're given, we're showing that we're actually loving God. We are expressing, we're, we're guarding his commandment. It's a value to us. Those who are actually loving God, it's all going to work out for our benefit. This does not mean it's going to work out the way we want it to work out. It does mean in the end it will be for our benefit. And it also does not mean that we're not going to face persecution. How the Lord manifests himself to us is not how he's going to do it to the world. John chapter 14, verse 22. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? So it's like, now, now how can we be able to see you, but the world won't actually be able to see you? Because Judas is not fully understanding you know, and, and it makes sense. He's not really fully understanding the resurrection and what's going to happen at the resurrection. You know, their their focus, and, and this so far is what has been revealed, is there will be a resurrection at the end where everybody's resurrected. But Christ is talking about something a little different. But, you know, he does talk about here in moving on to verse uh, 23, he says, Jesus answered and said to him, Uh, let me get over here. Yeah, 23. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will guard my word, and my Father will love him, and he will come to him, and we will make our home with him. The Father will make a place alongside those who love Christ. And this is really what he's talking about, this place. He's going to be alongside us. By the way, this this word, uh, our home with him, he's going to make a home. Uh, it's the same word that is mistranslated as a mansion. He's not going to make a mansion next to us. That's not what he's talking about. His home is going to be where the church is at. The church is actually going to be the Holy of Holies. That's where God is going to be home at. The one loving the Father, he's going to come and he's going to make his home there. Remember, Christ is seated at the right hand of God right now. That is where he is seated. We are actually in Christ, so therefore, technically, we are seated at the right hand of Christ. God's not somewhere up in the universe. He's right next to us. Hard to think of it that way, but the reality is, in Christ, we're right next to the Father. Here in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 20, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavens. It's not really heavenly places, it's just heavens. Because of this, we're to set our minds on the things above. Colossians chapter 3. Starting in verse 1, it says, Since, therefore, you have been raised with Christ. Now, I know some of our translations will say if. But the if is, well, if you haven't, then it's not true. But if you have, it is true. Well, have, been, have we been raised with Christ? Well, we have. If you believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again on the third day, you have been raised with Christ. God actually imputes that death and resurrection to you. So this is true in that sense. It would be better in English to actually translate it as sense. We still have the if element there, because if you haven't, then obviously it's not true. But since we have, we have been raised with Christ, we are to seek those things that are above, not the things here on the earth. These are the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind, and your, your word mind here is your reflective thinking. Set your reflective thinkings on the things of the uh, things above, not on the things of the earth, where, where our mind should be focused on. Now, of course, those who do not love 
Christ aren't going to love his commandment. They're not going to guard his commandment. John chapter 14, verse 24. And he who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. Because, yeah, Christ came giving us the word from the Father. That was his whole focus, was to present what the Father had given him. And, of course, he specifically says what this word is over in John chapter 13, verse 34. A new commandment I give to you. Love one another. Remember, this is loving one another of the same kind. We do not express love towards the world or the people of the world. Okay, not in the same way we express love towards the brethren. If you want to express love towards the world, the only thing you should express towards the world is giving them the gospel for salvation. Follow what God did. God, in expressing love towards the world, what did he do? Gave his son. Why did he give his son? So we could be saved. He did not say, oh, I'm just going to accept you as you are. No, no. That's not actually, that's not love at all. If you're going to accept somebody in a way where they have a lifestyle of corruption and destruction, and that's where it's headed, to accept them as they are is not love. Now, God doesn't expect us to change because the reality is we can't. He expects us to disbelieve. But he still saved us. We are to love other brethren. We are to seek the best for, the, for other Christians. Christ has told the disciples this so that they would understand. And I think I'm supposed to be in 14. By this, you will know that I am your, that, yeah. That's uh, verse 34 talks about that. The fact that the world will know that we are actually uh, disciples of Christ by our love for one another, by our love among the saints. 